I want to thank you for downloading or streaming this message from Victory. We believe that the starting point for real life change is centered around God's word lived out with God's people. So no matter who you are or where you are or what you're struggling with, our goal is to inspire and equip you with a new perspective that will give you a better way to do life. And we pray that as you live out God's word, you will truly experience something more, something better. And if you haven't experienced a live Victory service yet, we invite you to visit victorycc.life for more information on when and where you can join us. No matter where you are in the world, you can tune in with us through Victory Everywhere. That's what we're calling our online campus, Victory Everywhere. Or if you're local, we'd love to have you join us here in person. Here at Victory, we're contributors, not just consumers, and we consider it a privilege to give back what God has so freely given us. We celebrate generosity and the work that God does with our sacrificial giving and in our community and around the world. Now, if the message that you are about to hear helps you, inspires you, and challenges you in any way, we invite you to partner with us financially in our vision of connecting people back to God. Join us by going to victorycc.life slash give. Thank you again for watching. We hope you enjoy this message. Hung on a cross and left to die and resurrected three days later. No matter what you believe, we're all familiar with the story of Easter. But in the days and weeks before the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus, four men found their way into the Easter account as part of the plot to kill Jesus. Indicted by Caiaphas, the high priest, sold out by Judas, one of his closest friends, rejected over Barabbas, who went free in his place, mocked and accused by the thief on the cross. What did they each hope to gain? What do we have in common with them? And how can we avoid making the same mistakes they did? As Easter approaches, we're going back moments before the cross and diving into the lives of those who were responsible for killing Jesus. Morning. So glad to be back with you. Uh, and so many, get to see so many of you here in person. And I want to welcome all of our spring breakers watching online. A shout out to Victory Everywhere in Oklahoma, Pennsylvania, and Florida. And then Phil and Jay at Victory in the City. It's great to be with you guys a couple of weeks ago. Uh, but if this is your first Sunday with us, we're in the third week of our series called Killing Jesus. So if you missed any of it and you want to get caught up, you can go do that on demand. It's in the app. It's online. And here's what we've been doing. We've been examining the weeks leading up to Jesus's arrest and crucifixion. And we've been studying the lives of four men whose lives intersect with Jesus. So these four men were at odds with God and Jesus being the image of the invisible God, that meant that put them specifically at odds with Jesus. And then here's the crazy thing. And the scary thing is that if we actually dare to look closely at their lives, we will see ourselves in these men. Now, if you're not a Jesus follower, you might be shocked to hear what many people who try to live their lives to follow Jesus, they'll show up in church, they'll sing the songs. You might be surprised with what is actually the thing that we struggle with when it comes to our relationship with God. But I believe that we struggle, uh, this, this struggle could be one of our biggest barriers to experiencing growth in our relationship with God. It's one of the things that keeps us from trusting God with certain parts of our lives. It's one of the things that keeps us from accepting our identity, our calling, and actually living the life that Jesus' followers are called to live. But when we boil it down, it's really a, a failure. Now, we all will encounter failure, but I'm talking about a very specific failure. And if you are a Jesus follower, you've got to know what to do with this failure because this failure will affect the quality and the direction of your life. So the sooner you discover how to navigate this failure, the better it will be because it doesn't matter if you're eight or 80, this failure will affect your experience and how you live out your life. This failure affects how you view your self-worth, your purpose, your calling, and your future. This failure affects how you deal with your kids, how you deal with disappointment, how we deal with the things that make us anxious. And I believe that this failure affects our ability to fully experience the God we say we love. This failure affects our ability to, to worship at times. And if you struggle with it, I want you to hear from me that you're not alone. I can say me too. This failure has led me to make bad decisions 
This failure's kept me from doing the right thing or being the right person. So I have to admit that I fail at this sometime and I want to stop failing at this and I want to help you avoid this. You ready? As a Jesus follower, one of the biggest barriers to living out God's will for our life is simply this. We fail to function in our forgiveness. That we fail to live our lives in response to God's forgiveness over our life. Like we think that we're forgiven, but it is in what we trust in and who we forgive and how we view ourselves. We'll say we're forgiven, but the truth is, is we don't act like we're forgiven. And that's why when somebody asks you, hey, do you believe that you're going to heaven? You'll be like, I don't know. I think so. Like, I hope so. I'm just not sure. Why? Why is that? We fail to function in our forgiveness. Now, you might say, Josh, what do you mean? Like, we sing about forgiveness all the time. Today, we said, forgiven, accepted, redeemed by his grace. Your grace is perf- or patient, never giving up on me. Like, forgiveness is like every church song. I'm tired of singing about forgiveness. Like, what do you mean we fail to function in our forgiveness? And as Jesus followers, that means we don't live in response to the forgiveness that we're shown by God. Now, that is why so many of us carry around guilt. Like we'll say things like our guilt is gone or Jesus removed it, but to, we really don't fully understand or embrace the exchange that actually took place. And that's why it feels like our standing with God is always in question. That's why when, when somebody, uh, sometimes you don't boldly live out your faith in Christ. Now, if you're not a Christian, you probably think this is very strange. Like, how, how is it, right? How, how, why is it that, that deep down so many Jesus followers who will gather every week, who will join groups, who will be generous, they'll talk about forgiveness, but they fail to understand and live out the very thing they sing about? It's very strange. But you need to know that we also believe that the world, that you and I, we are facing an enemy. And no, Jesus followers don't think it's culture. It's not a political party. It's probably not your in-laws. Jesus' followers believe that everyone on earth has an enemy. The scripture describes the weapon of our enemy as deceptions, lies, and accusations. Deceptions, lies, and accusations. So no matter what you believe about this enemy, our enemy doesn't matter. It still will attack you. It's an equal opportunity offender. And it comes to us through different ways, but deceptions, lies, and accusations are its warfare. And our enemy is not a person. It's not a person, but sometimes it comes through to us through a person. We have an enemy who uses deception. And here's how you know that you've been under attack. If you've ever made a decision based on what you thought was true, what you thought was true only to discover that what you thought was true was not true. She omitted information. They distorted the facts. He withheld information that would have led me to the truth. See, as Jesus followers, we are taught that our enemy is not a person, it's not a company, it's not a political party, but our enemy uses all of those things in deceptions and lies and accusations. So as Jesus followers, when it comes to actually following Jesus and fighting off our enemy, we have to question ourselves. We have to ask this question, are we trusting the majority instead of God's authority? Do we believe in what the majority of culture says, the majority of our friends believe, or are we actually going to God for our final authority? Are we trusting the majority instead of God's authority when it comes to how we define things? Not who we accept. Jesus says, come as you are. Jesus says, you can belong before you believe. But Jesus also changes everything for everyone, including me, including you. So are we trusting the majority instead of God's authority? Not in who we accept, but in what we affirm. And so many times our enemy uses deceptions and uses confusion. And it's confused us enough to think that agreeing with Jesus is actually like acting like Jesus. Like we think that we've grown. We think that we've made progress. And when we agree with Jesus, great job, right? But we've been deceived, right? Agreeing with Jesus does not equal acting like Jesus, So what if the Jesus followers just love Jesus and love who Jesus loved, serves who Jesus served, fed who Jesus called us to feed? See, our enemy omits information, distorts the facts, and withholds the truth, deceptions, lies, and accusations. So here's how you know you're under attack. If you've ever been tricked, if you've ever believed a lie about yourself, maybe something you heard about yourself growing up, something that a parent told you that they didn't really mean it, but it stuck with you, Maybe it was a grade on a test or you got rejected from an opportunity. It's, it's what you heard was simply this. You're not smart enough. You're not good enough. You don't deserve all lies. 
I have a close friend going through a divorce. He didn't want it. It's a surprise for him. It's very painful, but I was talking with him. And one of his biggest barriers is he's believed the lies that she has told about him. He heard the lies so often, he actually believed that those lies were the, the truth. My friend would tell you that he doesn't believe that she's the enemy. She, he wants to reconcile with her, but we have an enemy who uses lies. But his most powerful weapon, I believe, is accusation. The reason I, I think it's the most powerful, because in my life, it's what I'm accused of that's true. His, powerful, his most powerful weapon is accusation because I really did it. That's why we carry around the guilt. That's why we carry around the shame. That's why we fail to function in our forgiveness. And I don't want you to just hear a sermon. I want you to participate in the message. message. So here's a rhetorical question. In what areas of your life do you feel the least forgiven? Don't say it out loud, right? But I want you to identify it. In what areas of your life do you feel the least forgiven? Like, what comes to mind? Is it a stage of life? Back in high school or back in college or back when I was a young parent or back in my first marriage? Is it an area of your life sexually, financially, professionally? The mistakes you've made, the sins you've committed, the lies that you believed in, what areas of your life do you feel least forgiven? Identify it. Our enemy's most powerful weapon is reminding us about what we really did. And here's why the accusations work so well on us. It's because we think to ourselves, well, if I was God, I wouldn't forgive me. If I was God, I would give up on me. Because I look at myself and say, you failed again? Really? Like how many times are you going to mess up? How many times will it take you to learn? How many times do you expect to just get forgiveness from me? If, if you've ever thought of that, I could just say me too. If I was God, I wouldn't have forgiven me. I would have given up on me a long time ago. And so the crazy thing is, and the scary thing is, is if we dare to look closely at our lives, we'll see ourselves in the account of the very people who were involved in killing Jesus. And as we study the moments leading up to Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, we find a character that seems to interrupt the biblical narrative. We encounter a man. uh, We don't really know why he's even mentioned, but we encounter this one man that you could just easily skim over and keep on reading as you read the Easter account. His name is Barabbas. And although that's not a very flattering pick, we don't really know what he looks like, so I picked the worst one, (laughs) right? But what we find him in all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and these eyewitnesses give us different vantage points and different perspectives about that same man. In fact, uh, Matthew shares with us that Barabbas has something in common with Jesus. At this time, they had a well-known prisoner whose name was, what? Jesus Barabbas. It's like, Matthew, did you stutter? (laughs) No, Jesus was a common name back then in Hebrew. And in Hebrew, it meant Yeshua, to rescue or to deliver. And that was the biblical name. So when you pick up and read the Bible, they are so much like us because Barabbas' mama named her kid a Bible name, right? And do you know why she did that? The same reason my parents did it. They named me Joshua. They gave me a Bible name hoping that I'd be a good kid, right? Your parents gave you a Bible name, Matt or Mary or Stephen or Jesus or John or Hannah. Why? They were hoping you'd be a good kid. Guess what? It doesn't work that way, does it? Now, I'm not positive, but I'm pretty sure a kid in fourth grade named Jesus stole my bike. So I'm just telling you, if you have a, getting ready to have a kid, this is very important, extra, you don't have, this is not part of the message, but just because you name your kid a Bible name doesn't mean they're going to be a good kid. So Barabbas had something in common with Jesus. He was named Yeshua to rescue, to deliver, but he also had this in common. Barabbas actually meant son of the father, which could also have been said about Jesus, who is the image of the invisible God. So Barabbas and Jesus have some things in common, but in this account, we discover that Barabbas was a notorious prisoner. In fact, Matthew tells us that at that time, he had a well-known or notorious prisoner whose name was Jesus Barabbas. Now, Mark tells us this, that a man called Barabbas was in prison with the insurrectionist, right? Someone who fought against Rome, who had committed murder in the uprising. Now, there's some biblical scholars believe that he was actually, Barabbas was an important rebel leader trying to overthrow the kingdom of Rome to establish his own kingdom on earth, which is exactly what Jesus was doing. He was bringing heaven to earth. So his followers would pledge their allegiance to the kingdom of heaven over earth. 
That's what Jesus was doing. Now, when the gospel writers record Jesus' insurrection, or intersect, life intersecting with Barabbas in the gospels, we find Barabbas was in prison for insurrection and murder. And get this, on the day they met, that the day they met, the day that Jesus would be crucified, Barabbas was scheduled to be crucified. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they all agree that Barabbas was a bad man. They all agree that Barabbas was guilty. They all agree that Barabbas deserved punishment. So he wasn't a first-time offender in rehab. No, Barabbas was a murderer on death row. Now, I want you to just... Look at the timeline of, well, this is what we call, Christians call the Good Friday. But Friday, uh, April 15th, 30 AD, between 1 and 1.30, Jesus is arrested in the garden. And then 1.30 to 3, Annas, a former Jewish high priest, he, he looks for an accusation against Jesus. So to buy time uh, for the Sanhedrin to assemble, Jesus receives physical abuse. So that's what was taking place. And number two is the trial in front, around the same, same time in front of the Sanhedrin court. Jesus is bloodied by abuse. Abused. And then he's in prison at Caiaphas's house around 3 to 5 p. a.m. Now, what's interesting is all the Jewish elders, including the high priest and the scribes and the whole Sanhedrin, they decide to ask the Roman government to kill Jesus. So that's what was going on. So they take Jesus from Caiaphas' house and they go all the way over to Herod's palace. Now, many scholars believe that, that Jesus was tried be before Pilate from Herod's palace on Friday, April 15th, 30 AD. So this is about 6 AM. So Jesus is standing before Pilate and now the ruling Jewish religious leaders illegally uh, tried Jesus even by Jewish standards that night. And so Jesus has already been illegally tried twice. He's been beaten several times by the religious leaders of the day. And now Jesus stands before Pilate. It says, meanwhile, Jesus stood before the governor who was Pilate and the governor asked him, are you the king of the Jews? which is the only charge that they could actually bring against Jesus, making Jesus an insurrectionist like Barabbas. Hey, he, you have said so, Jesus replied. And when he was accused by the chief priest uh, and the elders, he gave no answer. Now, from our perspective, we know that Jesus has to die on a certain day in a certain way to fulfill all of the prophecies predicted hundreds of years before that Jesus is arrested and abused, but he stands innocent and he stands silent before Pilate. Then Pilate asked him, don't you, don't you hear the testimony that they're bringing against you? But Jesus made no reply, not even to a single charge, to the great amazement of the governor. And now it was the governor's custom at the festival to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. So now in this day, the prisoners to be executed, they were held in another place, but in the morning, they were taken into Herod's palace in this holding cell right here, early in the morning. So the morning of the crucifixion, where they recorded that the governor's custom was to release a prisoner at Passover as a gift from the Romans to the Jews. It says at that time, a well-known prisoner whose name was Jesus Barabbas, right? So after being flogged, Jesus stands in front of Pilate and Barabbas is in the holding cell. Does that make sense? Jesus is out here, Barabbas is over here, and in this moment, Pilate thinks, I'm the one who holds the destiny of these two men in my hands. I'm the one who has the power to release whomever I choose. And so Pilate stands on that platform, and he presents Jesus, the son of the living God, versus Barabbas, this murderous thug, right? Now remember, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all agree that Barabbas was a bad man. They all agree that Barabbas was guilty according to Jewish law and Roman law. The Barabbas deserved punishment. He was the rightful prisoner and he should have been on death row because he was the rebel who led a rebellion. He's a murdering thug crook who deserves the chains. He deserves the whips. He deserves the crucifixion. And on the other hand, you have Jesus. Where Luke tells us three times, Pilate declares to the crowd, Jesus is innocent. Like what has Jesus done but heal people? and restore people, and deliver people, and set people, people free, and open blind eyes, and open deaf ears, and heal the lame and the leper. Innocent Jesus versus guilty Barabbas. So Matthew records that the crowd had gathered. I want you to go back to first century. Can you picture it? The crowds gathering in first century Jerusalem early in the morning. The crowds are gathering in. Everyone's pushing in. Everyone's trying to get in on this because the people know that they get to play a part in the fate of these two men. So Pilate asked them, which one do you want me to release to you, Jesus Barabbas or Jesus who is called the Messiah? Messiah meaning God's final king. 
So Matthew, who was there, he gives us this detail. But the chief priest and the elders, all right, uh, per- persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus executed. Which of the two do you uh, want me to release to you? They asked the governor. Barabbas. They answer. So who do you want? We want Barabbas. John says this. They shouted back, give us Barabbas. Can you hear the crowds chanting? We want Barabbas. Give us Barabbas. Now, this is an important detail. And and feeling this message, not just hearing this message, because the historians and the archaeologists suggest that those who were sentenced to die would have been brought up here and from their prison cells, awaiting their execution the morning of their death. So this is holding the holding area where it would have been about 500 feet from where the crowd was gathered. In the holding area was a man named Barabbas who knew he deserved to be crucified. So maybe early that morning, Barabbas hears the crowd gather. Maybe early that morning, he hears the commotion. And he knows that these will be his last hours here on earth, that he'll spend on earth, and he's awaiting his execution. He doesn't know the routine, but he can't help but hear the crowds and sense the anticipation of the crowds. Put yourself in that holding cell for just a second. Now, remember, this is before microphones. This is before speakers, so Pilate asks a question, but Barabbas doesn't hear the question. So this is important. What does Barabbas hear? Barabbas hears his name. Barabbas, Barabbas, Barabbas. And then Barabbas hears a pause. He doesn't hear what's said next, but we know because John was there that Pilate stands in front of the crowds and he says, what shall we do with Jesus who is called the Messiah? Pilate asked and they answered, crucify him, crucify him. So from his prison cell, what does Barabbas hear? Barabbas, 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 crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. He sees the guards approaching. He knows his time has come. The crowd deliver the sentence. He is headed to the executioner. Can you envision it as the Roman soldiers drag fighting Barabbas in front of the people? The people are shouting and cheering for Barabbas, Barabbas, Barabbas. The soldiers come and grab the chains and put the key in the lock and unlock Barabbas. And now he's free. He's free from his chains. He's free from his shackles. He's stunned. Is is this a dream? Am I hallucinating? He walks down into the crowd. The crowd welcomes him, cheers him on. Barabbas, Barabbas. Can you picture it? The moment that he sees Jesus has taken his place and that he is set free. Now, this is the part that bothers me because there's no record of him actually turning to Jesus. There's, there's, there seems to be no conscience in Barabbas. We never hear him thank Jesus for taking his place. No, none of that. We don't see any of that in Barabbas. And if you're a Jesus follower, here's something that you believe. Jesus knew that Barabbas deserved punishment. Jesus knew that Barabbas deserved crucifixion. Jesus knew that Barabbas deserved death. But for Barabbas to be set free, Jesus also knew that he was going to have to take his place. For Barabbas to be forgiven, Jesus also knew that the father would have to treat Jesus like Barabbas deserved so that he could treat Barabbas like Jesus. Don't miss this. Barabbas thought it was the people that set him free. No, 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 no. You are here today because God wants you to know it was the love of the Father. If you dare to look closely at this account, if you dare to dig deep into this account, if you dare to dig into the heart, here's what we realize of why this interaction actually made it into the Gospels. If we dare to be really be honest with ourselves, we will see who Barabbas really is. I am Barabbas. You are Barabbas. We are Barabbas. And just like the people involved in killing Jesus, Jesus took our place and Jesus took our punishment and Jesus offered to set us free. And that same exchange has been offered to every living person since, fully and finally forgiven. Now, what really bugs me in this account is we never hear from Barabbas again. Why? Because he failed to function in his forgiveness And I don't want that to happen to you. He met Jesus, interacted with Jesus, was next to Jesus, but failed to be changed by Jesus. He failed to recognize the extent of God's love. He failed to recognize the level of God's concern over his life. He failed to experience full forgiveness that was available to him. And I know I asked this earlier, but in what area of your life do you feel the least forgiven? What is it that's holding you back 
What comes to mind? What's the barrier that you just can't get past? You need to know it doesn't matter what you've done or how far you've run from God. It doesn't matter if your life mirrors more Barabbas more than it does Jesus. God wants you to know that God is saying to you, I love Barabbas. I love him. And I know what you're thinking. God, he's a bad man. God, don't you know what he's accused of? God, don't you know what he's done? God, don't you know that he'll probably never, ever accept you or acknowledge that you ever intervened in his life and you paid with the life of your son in his place? Don't you know that? But God is saying, I love him. And I wanted him to go free. And that's how Paul describes the forgiveness and the love of our God. He says, but God demonstrates, he demonstrates, he demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still what? Sinners, Christ died for us. Church, God sent his son for Barabbas. God sent his son to replace Barabbas. And God is saying, I love Barabbas. Even when he knew Barabbas would walk away from him and never come back, God loved Barabbas. Even when he knew that he would fail to function in his forgiveness. So you go back to your greatest shame. Go back to your deepest regret. Go back to that faith paralyzing moment and hear me with love because I'm coming after your excuses. When we fail to function in our forgiveness, we think too much of ourselves. Because that's not what scripture describes, what actually happens. We've been deceived. God's word says that while we were what? Still sinners, Christ died for us. See, when we fail to function in our forgiveness, that means we have the nerve and we have the audacity to think that when the exchange happened in our lives, when Jesus took our place, it was like 85% Jesus and 15% us. Or maybe we're having a good day. We actually made it to church. So my standing with God is like 60% Jesus and 40% me. You need to know that that's a lie from the pit of hell. Our forgiveness has always centered on Jesus. It's always been Jesus. It will always be Jesus. And there is no sin. You have to clean up before you come to Jesus. The exchange, the price that was paid, the reason we have access to forgiveness has always been 100% Jesus, just like it was that day when the life of Jesus freed Barabbas. But we fail to function in our forgiveness. We begin to be deceived into thinking that God's forgiveness is based on us. And so we struggle with being who Jesus calls us to be. We believe that we can like shake it off or we can defend ourselves or we can just will ourselves. Stop it. You won't. You're not good enough. You can't overcome it. You will never overcome it. There is no answer within yourself. You cannot find the answer to heal your own marriage or be good enough or do your own discipline or be devoted enough. Your power alone will not save your marriage. Your power alone will never save your kids. And here's how you know. You've tried and you realize I am not the savior. There's only one that has taken my place. There's only one that stood silently on the platforms with Barabbas. He's the one that allowed him to take his life instead. And if you struggle with this idea of forgiveness, you're not alone. How many times have I stood on the platform in my mind with Jesus and Pilate and I'm the Barabbas and they start to take off my chains and I believe the lies and I believe the deception. I believe the accusations of my enemies. And so I said, no, 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 no. I deserve this. I deserve the guilt. I deserve the pain. I deserve the shame. I deserve the consequences. I deserve it. See, we were involved in killing Jesus, but Jesus, our savior, Jesus, our Lord, Jesus, our friend, he seems to look at me and say, no, son, let me have it. Let me have all of your sin. Let me have all of your pain. And I turn my back and say, no, God, I did it to myself. I deserve the divorce. I deserve the heartbreak. I deserve the poverty. I deserve the sickness. I deserve it all. In what areas of your life do you feel at least forgiven? We argue with God and God, I'm so ashamed. And God says, give me your shame. But God, what if I do it again? And God says, my grace is sufficient for you. You are my son. You are my child. Give it to me. Give me all of it. See, if you're a Jesus follower, the greatest challenge is not your discipline, is not your devotion, is not your focus. Your greatest challenge is actually believing the gospel. 
living out the gospel, living as if we were truly free indeed, believing that there is a God with a love so scandalous and so deep and so wide and so vast and so expansive and so welcoming and so inclusive that I can give him all my sin. Jesus takes my punishment and my pain and my place and I am set free. Like where did we get off thinking that we set ourselves free? It's still Jesus, it will always be Jesus, it will never stop being Jesus. His blood is sufficient for our salvation. His blood is sufficient to sustain us through every challenge and every sin and every temptation. Jesus is enough. He's crucified in our place. That should have been us. So our number one challenge, if you've never accepted that forgiveness or walked in that forgiveness, we have baptism available to you today. You can accept forgiveness in the waters of baptism. There's nothing you have to clean up first. The first followers of Jesus, this was their first step that every Jesus follower took. So if you want more information on that, or if you wanna do that today, there's a next steps room, it's out the door to the left. That's the number one challenge. The number two challenge is simply this. If you're a Jesus follower and you're in the room, we need you to identify in what areas of your life you feel least forgiven. Name it. Where am I believing the weapons of my enemy, the deception, the lies, the accusations? Where am I trusting the majority of my thoughts instead of God's authority over my life? Where am I failing to function in my forgiveness? Is it a belief about myself? Is it a relationship I need to heal? Is it a step towards holiness that Jesus purchased for me? Jesus follows, we're in a fight. We're in a battle. We will mess up and those accusations might even be true, but because of a day when Jesus freed Barabbas, you can know to your core that our forgiveness has always been and will always be 100% Jesus. And we can look back and we can discover that a cross meant to kill. Well, that cross, it's our victory. Would you pray with me? Father, I just thank you so much for this account in scripture. Father, I just thank you so much for the reality that you took our place. Father, I pray that that would seep deep into our hearts, deep into our lives, that we'd be make decisions this week knowing that we're fully and finally forgiven. Father, I pray that you would draw near us as we draw new, near you, and we would be different. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We get to witness some amazing life change today. Check this out.